Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W. We're continuing our discussion of the American home front during World War II. In the previous lectures, we've talked about roles for women and African Americans during the war. In this lecture, we're going to talk about one of the most unfortunate episodes of the entire war, the internment of Japanese Americans on the American home front. After the attack at Pearl Harbor and a string of other Japanese victories in the Pacific, by February of 1942, a wave of anti-Japanese sentiment was building, particularly on the West Coast in the United States and throughout the American media. Newspapers attacked the Japanese Americans, creating the perception of a threat when one in truth really didn't exist. The Los Angeles Times, for instance, wrote, a viper is nonetheless a viper, wherever the egg is hatched. So a Japanese American, born of Japanese parents, grows up to be a Japanese, not an American. There was also racism among many high-ranking officials. The most outspoken of them was General John L. DeWitt, the West Coast Army commander, who stated, a Jap's a Jap, to a congressional panel. DeWitt ignored ample evidence showing that the Japanese Americans were loyal and posed no discernible threat. To make matters worse, the Japanese were vulnerable. They were really a small population located almost exclusively on the West Coast, and they weren't particularly crucial to any aspect of the local economy or labor force. They were small in numbers, and they were considered expendable. And so on February 19, 1942, FDR signed Executive Order 9066, authorizing the mass evacuation of Japanese Americans from the West Coast. This is, in fact, the internment order. The United States then began the process of rounding up a total of about 120,000 Japanese Americans, two-thirds of them born in the United States and American citizens. They were herded into 15 hastily put together assembly centers and later into 10 more permanent internment camps. I would note that the total population of Japanese Americans at that time was about 150,000. So there were some 30,000 or so who didn't go into the internment camps. We will backtrack a little bit later in this discussion and explain what happened to that other 30,000. But for all intents and purposes, nearly all Japanese Americans at that time went into the camps. The first formal mass evacuation began on March 31st of 1942. The evacuees were forced to leave behind them anything but what they could carry in a few bags. Evacuees had to leave their belongings in storage, sell it, give it away, or trust friends to hold on to it and for an unfortunate many of them, their property after they got out of the camps was either gone or destroyed. Millions of dollars in property was lost when they were taken away. The centers were typically located on old fairgrounds or horse tracks, which were the only spaces suitable for such purposes. And many of them were made to live in the former horse stables most received a sack to fill with straw for a mattress. The sick or elderly may have gotten a cotton mattress. Each family was assigned to a single room, about 15 by 20 in size. That single room might contain eight beds and 15 to 20 people, depending on the size of the family. So one can imagine the issues with overcrowding and lack of privacy that afflicted all of these camps. As one survivor commented, loud snores, the grinding of teeth, the wail of babies, the murmur of conversations, these could be heard the full length of the stable. Imagine living in a horse stable. Insects, rats, mice, etc. crawled through the barracks. Spiders and ants were everywhere. Barbed wire fences surrounded each of the centers. Armed guards circulated constantly among the internees, and there were guard towers placed systematically throughout the camps. 
Most camps had curfews, forcing internees to be in the barracks from nightfall to sunrise. Guests and mail from the outside were closely scrutinized. Guests were only allowed in certain areas and at certain times, and all had to pass through tight security. The mail was also closely inspected, and many personal letters were read and sometimes censored, cut apart, or blacked out. And so you get a sense from the picture on this screen that the camps, they were living in prison-like conditions, even though we have virtually no record of any kind of resistance or any attempts to escape. While conditions were poor in the camps, the internees showed a remarkable degree of agency. There was virtually no furniture provided in the barracks and around the camps, so internees would sift through old piles of lumber and pallets to make their own furniture. The camps were so poorly manned for medical facilities that the internees provided their own doctors and dentists. Hospitals were run by white administrators, but functioned with virtually all Japanese-American doctors, nurses, and staffs. Dental clinics, too, were run by the internees themselves, who were limited to routine and simple procedures by order of the health department. Internees also served as their own firemen. They served as fire inspectors walking the ground in search of problems and worked in shifts to keep an eye out for fire. Perhaps their scrutiny worked, as fires were rare in the centers. In August of 1942, the bathroom facility at one center was destroyed after an internee threw a match in the toilet. Perhaps it was thought that wasn't such a good thing, as they had to rebuild an even better latrine in the aftermath. Education was a critical concern to the internees. Of course, no one knew in the beginning how long they might live in these camps. In the end, it was nearly four years that they were confined to the camps. So imagine young children living with no source of education for a span of years. There were limited facilities provided for instruction, and the facilities were packed to capacity by thousands of kids. While the education received wasn't necessarily inferior to that of regular schools, the curriculum was closely watched. It stressed assimilation in its classes, teaching courses like Americanism and democracy training. The Japanese language was forbidden, with the exception of religious books and English-Japanese dictionaries. Children had to salute the American flag and began the day by singing my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty. And of course, there is intense irony in the fact that they had to say those words while looking out through barbed wire of the prison camps. Finally, the internees tried to entertain themselves through a variety of ways. There were many sports activities and even sports teams and leagues created in the camps. The most popular sports were baseball and softball. There were teams for boys and girls and different leagues for all ages. In some camps, the men's baseball league alone might support as many as 50 teams, and large crowds would gather to watch the games, as you can see from the picture here. In spite of these kind of entertainments, the internment robbed these citizens of years of their lives, and many grew weak and died while in the camps. The internment of the Japanese Americans is a significant blight on America's historical record. A federal commission in 1983 determined, quote, that the broad historical causes which shaped these decisions were race prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. In 1988, Congress passed a law issuing an apology to the survivors of the encampment and paid each of the remaining 60,000 or so survivors, $20,000. This was more than 40 years after the event itself. While the ensuing years have shown the internment to be a horrible abuse of the people, at that time many Americans thought we didn't go far enough, some even wanting to deport the Japanese Americans. <laughs> 
Now let me return to the question of the 30,000 or so who did not go into the camps. I should point out that the Japanese Americans were more than just victims of internment during the war. Many Japanese Americans actually served for the United States during the war. Believing the best way to disprove the idea that they weren't loyal was to fight. About 33,000 Japanese Americans joined the war effort, making up the remaining total of that 150,000 or so in the country. While many of them fought on the front lines, perhaps their most crucial role came in the form of translating documents and other intelligence functioned. They listened in on radio lines and interpreted documents. And one American general estimated that Japanese American contributions shortened the war by as much as two years. In our final lecture, about American life on the home front, we'll talk about one more group that was mistreated during the war, Jewish refugees.